Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Though there is no good way to find out that your wife is having an affair, some are worse than others. Learning of my wife's infidelity from my mother probably tops the list of embarrassing ways. It was an added humiliation that I didn't need. Before I married Darlene, my mother warned me against her and begged me to find a nice Italian girl to marry. I didn't listen to her, and now that she had proof that she was right, she didn't have to remind me of her warning. My name is Tony. I was picking up my 10-year-old son, Arthur, from my mother's house. She was crying. The last time I saw my mother crying was 10 years ago at my father's funeral. At first, I thought my son was injured, but I saw him behind my mother playing with the brand new iPhone I gave him for his birthday two days ago. Then I thought Darlene, my wife of 20 years must have had a car accident. With tears forming in my eyes, I asked if Darlene was all right. My mother nodded yes. My mother motioned for me to sit down and asked my son to go play outside on the swing taking his iPhone from him. After Darlene dropped off Arthur, he showed me his new iPhone. He had unknowingly recorded Darlene in the car on the way over. My mother then played a recording on my wife's phone call. My wife was making plans with a man named Scott to go away in a few days for a weekend to Las Vegas. She would tell me that it was a business trip and they would have a long weekend of fun. They would leave early Friday morning. She was now on the way to his house, after she dropped off our son at her mother-in-law's and Scott explained that he would meet her there in 30 minutes. She should use the key under the big planter to let herself in. She had hired Scott's attorney to file for her divorce from me. She and Scott bragged that when they returned from their trip, she would tell me the truth, claim I beat her, with a black eye courtesy of Scott, and have me arrested for spousal abuse, jailed, and take everything I owned including my son. They laughed at how I was just a stupid, boring, clueless car salesman. Darlene said that soon I would be Bubba's new love interest in prison and laughed. Once I was in prison, Scott would move into my house, make love to my wife on our bed, force my son call him dad and prevent me from ever seeing my son again. That was the end of the recording. My wife had no idea that her secret life was now revealed. At first, for just a moment, I thought it might be possible to reconcile if she stopped the affair right now. Then I realized that there was no hope for a happy ending. They weren't planning my divorce. They were planning my destruction. In a few minutes my love for my wife turned into anger and disgust. I couldn't understand how or why she could hate me so much. Why couldn't she just file for divorce? Why did she have to frame me for a crime, destroy my life, steal my son from me and have me jailed? She and Scott wanted to go scorched earth on me, so now I would do the same to them. As the shortest kid in all my elementary school classes, I quickly learned that if I didn't fight back decisively against any tough guy, the bullying would never end. I never won any of those fights, but none of those a-holes ever tried again to bully me or fight with me. When the tough guy threw a punch, I would grab his fist, bite his wrist until he opened his fingers, and then I would quickly bend back one or two of his fingers until they broke. It may not have been elegant, but it was effective. I recognized my adversary by his name and voice. He worked with my wife at the same real estate agency. He was much taller than I, much more muscular and totally self-centered, a trait he shared with my wife. He lived about a half mile from me. I'd been to parties at his house where after more than a few drinks, he bragged about being a stud and being irresistible to married women after his recent medical procedure. A few more drinks later, and he bragged that he had an injection done to make him about an inch and a half thicker, down below. He called his doctor, the Injector General. I thought he was too much of a shit to be a threat to my marriage, and dismissed his bragging. That was a major error on my part. It wasn't that I trusted Scott. I trusted my wife. I always laughed at men who were constantly suspicious of their wives, and always checked up on them. I always thought that was silly. Now I realize that these men were smarter than I was. Still, I didn't want to go through life as an amateur sleuth or worse yet, her prison warden. What's the point of living with and loving a woman you didn't trust? My impression of Scott was that he was an arrogant a-hole who always smirked at me when we met. He was single with few expenses other than a fancy car and fancy clothes. He always bragged that he was living La Vida Loco. I'll give him a La Vida Loco up his number five. My mother had a Sicilian temper. I want to wring her neck until she's dead. My mother whispered. What will you do? My mother asked. I don't know yet, but I'm sure as hell going to make it epic. I wasn't interested in just revenge. 
I was consumed by visions of their annihilation. It was also a matter of self-preservation. I had to destroy them, before they destroyed me, and more importantly before they destroyed my relationship with my son. Tony, don't do anything rash or violent. My mother said, you must stay out of jail for the sake of your son. If you're arrested for beating this guy up, you'll lose custody. Use your brains and your wits, not your fists or your guns. As I previously indicated, I'm not a tough guy. I don't have friends who are tough guys or special forces or marines. Yes, I'm Sicilian, but to my knowledge, I never even met anyone in the mob. I and most of my friends sell cars and trucks. Our biggest crimes, now that cannabis was legal, were exceeding the speed limit or not stopping long enough at a stop sign. I met my wife when she was the real estate agent. I leased an apartment from her. That week we had dinner and later she leased a car from me. It may not be the most romantic way to meet, but our marriage had been good for 19 and a half of the 20 years we were together. I thought I had been a good husband. I did most of the cooking. My mother had been a chef at several high-end Italian restaurants and taught me to cook. I was pretty good at it, though my mother always said there was room for improvement. A couple of times a year, I bought my wife flowers. I showered her with compliments. My wife needed that because she was very vain bordering on narcissistic. I never cheated or even flirted with other women. I rarely drank. I never got drunk. Well, not after that New Year's Eve, 10 years ago. I wasn't movie star good looking, but neither was my wife. I wasn't rich with a mansion and yacht, but I worked hard to support my family while even helping around the house. I spent more time taking care of our son than she did. I won't tell you that I was the world's greatest lover, with muscular physique like a bodybuilder, but she had never complained, at least not to me. The three girls with whom I slept before I met my future wife never complained either, though in truth, neither did they claim to have seen fireworks or felt the earth move. What the hell did she want? Of course, her hours with her lover were more exciting than our time together. They could act like carefree teenagers with no responsibility. It was forbidden and filled with novelty and the excitement of cheating and someone new. They didn't spend their time together worrying about paying bills, grocery shopping, repairing the house and helping a child with homework or pretending to laugh when he told us his fourth grade version of a joke. Scott never took care of Darlene when she was sick or held a wet washcloth to her forehead as she vomited into the toilet like I had on more than one occasion. That's the other side of romance in a marriage, the side that separates permanent real love from mere temporary sexual infatuation. I decided that her cheating had nothing to do with me, but with her craving novelty and excitement. Looking back in time, it was now clear to me that my wife had been having an affair for at least six months. Suddenly, she had to work late one Wednesday a month showing houses. What the two of them did during the work day was still a mystery, but now I had a clue. I needed to double-check her infidelity. As I drove my son home, we detoured past Scott's house and I noted my wife's car parked outside. I returned home, with tears in my eyes, and erased the incriminating recording on my son's iPhone. I went to my bedroom, turned on the stereo to drown out any noise, and then cried into my pillow for an hour. I looked into the mirror and saw how red and puffy my eyes were. I showered. My wife was home two hours later for dinner time. She kissed me as if nothing was out of the ordinary. I noticed that her hair was damp. She too had recently showered. She asked why my eyes were red and I told her that I got some shampoo in them while I showered. She brought home Thai food, which she loved. As we sat down for dinner I asked about her day. She claimed nothing special had happened. She showed some houses to a couple who she derisively labeled looky loos. When she asked me about my day, I shook my head in sadness and made up a story to try and painlessly teach her a lesson about the consequences of infidelity. I told her of a story I read on the internet about a man who found his wife cheating on him when he returned home early from work. He's in jail now after he beat the shit out of his wife and her lover. His wife used to be beautiful, but I think he knocked out all her teeth and her boyfriend's Johnson is half to the size it used to be. I guess he won't be using it anymore with women who are married or I guess an other kind of woman. It's exactly what he deserved. My wife was shocked. The scumsucker, why didn't he just file for divorce? She asked. I shook my head no. I think he did the right thing. Maybe he'll go to jail for six months, but if there are any married men on the jury, he won't be convicted. She and her lover, however, will carry those scars for the rest of their lives. 
I think he was perfectly justified. If I were in his shoes, I'd have done the same thing. I took my wife's chin with my hands. You have such beautiful teeth. My wife looked at me with shock on her face. I wouldn't, however, have been so obvious. I wouldn't want to go to jail. I would have stalked them both, found an opportune time, and while wearing a mask, tasered both of them, then beat the crap out of both of them. Lucky for me that I'm married to a woman who's always been faithful to me. Isn't that right, dear? My wife rose from her chair weak on her feet and shaking as she kissed me. Of course, dear, I'd never do anything like that. Then she went over to the liquor cabinet and poured herself a glass of Bailey's Irish cream, drank it and then poured herself another. I took my wife's hand and told her how much I loved her. I told her that if she cheated it would destroy me and our son. She swore that she never did and never would. I think her lies hurt even more than her adultery. Good, I responded, because I would never want to harm you. I thought I had scared my wife straight, and she was smart enough to take the hint and end her affair, but she wasn't as bright as I had previously thought. She told me that she was attending a real estate symposium in Bakersfield for the weekend. I told her that was exciting, and I would enjoy spending the weekend with her there. That's not a good idea, she responded. She would be in classes all day, and too tired to enjoy any time with me afterwards, and besides Bakersfield was completely boring, with nothing for me to do there while she was in class. She would be leaving at 11 a.m. on Friday from her office. I agreed with her and said I wouldn't go. She seemed relieved. I remembered my mother's warning not to use my guns, and that gave me a plan for revenge, and I thought it was a good one. I went to the basement and opened my gun safe. I pushed aside my Colt 1911, 45 caliber pistol, and the Beretta 9mm. I bought those in the past few years, and they were registered with the state leaving an unwanted indelible trail leading back to me like Hansel and Greta's breadcrumbs. I took out an ancient Browning 22 caliber pistol that I had inherited from my dad, who inherited it from his dad before gun sales were recorded. There was no record of the original purchase over 70 years ago that would lead back to me or my family. I put on latex gloves and disassembled it, wiping off any fingerprints from the pieces as well as the bullets in the magazine. Then I put it back together. I threw away the box of 22 caliber ammo in someone's trash can a mile away from my home. Now there was no evidence that I had ever owned a .22. Later I went to a hardware store at the other end of town and with cash bought zip ties large enough to handcuff people. Of course, I wore a big hat and sunglasses in case of security cameras. My plan was simple but required some good luck. I also made a phone call to the Bakersfield Casino and Hotel. It was part of my alibi in case my plan went south. The next morning I watched Scott leave for work. I used the key he told my wife that he hid in his planter and entered his condo. I found his computer and searched on Yahoo and Google about a bunch of terror outfits. I figured that if they were leaving Friday afternoon, I had just barely the window of opportunity that I needed. He would probably be packed up Thursday night. I had to find a way to get into his suitcase. I had no way of entering his car trunk. So I had to disable his car and force him to take my wife's car for which I did have a key. On Thursday night I went for a walk. I drove to a block from Scott's house and punctured two of his tires with nails that I left in the clean shiny obviously brand new tires, then I drove home. The next morning my wife received a phone call from Scott and had to pick him up to drive him to work. So far so good. I drove to work, parked away from the security cameras, clocked in, and then took a bathroom break. I quickly drove to my wife's office and parked a block away. I opened the trunk on my wife's car, and while wearing rubber gloves, I placed the handgun and zip ties in Scott's suitcase. Then I drove back to work with no one aware I'd been gone. For hours later, I received a frantic phone call from my wife. She was under arrest at the airport and needed me to post bail and hire a criminal lawyer for her. What the hell are you doing at the airport? I screamed. It's complicated, she replied. Let me speak to the cops, I said, while trying to remain calm. The TSA inspector explained that my wife was with a man who tried to board a plane with a gun and zip ties for handcuffing people. They were both under arrest. My wife would be transferred to a federal holding facility awaiting further investigation. I thanked him and hung up. You probably wouldn't be surprised to learn that I didn't post bail or hire a lawyer for her. Her parents did. They also retrieved her car. At their trial, my wife and Scott's defense was based on the theory that I had planted the gun and zip ties after I learned of their affair. Easy to claim, not so easy to prove. 
When the prosecution placed into evidence Scott's browser history of researching various terror outfits, the defense claimed that I broke in and did it, but they couldn't prove how other than that I guessed where he hid a key to his place. From the look on the lawyer's face, even he thought that was a stretch. Their lawyer grilled me for an hour on the witness stand, but never laid a glove on me. He asked about my gun collection. I told him of the two guns I owned, one of 45 caliber, the other a 9mm. I had never owned a 22, I said. The police had checked my gun safe, and that officer's testimony corroborated my story. There was no record of me ever buying or owning such a gun. I had even made reservations for myself and our son for a hotel in Bakersfield where she said she was going, claiming I wanted to surprise my wife because I believed her story. My wife's attorney also asked if I slashed Scott's tires. I replied, no, when her attorney asked, so you expect the jury to believe you were that naive about your wife's infidelity? Counselor, I responded, I admit that I wasn't naive. Her attorney's eyes opened wide. He was shocked at my admission. Before he could say another word, I continued, I plead guilty to being an idiot and total fool who loved and trusted my wife 100% for 20 years. Of course, the defense attorney objected, but it was overruled since he brought up my naivety. On cross-examination, the U.S. attorney put my time card for that day into evidence. It showed I was at work and had no opportunity to plant any evidence. Then she introduced my wife's iPhone, which was password protected and showed no spyware enabling me to read its contents. The U.S. attorney placed into evidence the report from AAA Auto Club indicating that the flat tires on Scott's car were caused by two nails. The tires had not been slashed. She asked if I had removed any money from our joint bank accounts, canceled her credit cards, changed my will, my life insurance, or stopped depositing my paycheck into our joint account before she was arrested. Those are things that a man who knows his wife is cheating would do automatically. I had done none of those things, which was evidentiary that I didn't know about my wife's affair. The U.S. attorney and I had spent several hours together going over my testimony. She was a relatively new attorney and this was in essence, her trial by fire. We got along well. I thought she had a great sense of humor because she laughed at all my jokes. She was an adorable brunette, but too young for me. While I was on the stand, she asked if my wife left for girls' nights out. I said she didn't. She asked if she came home very late from work. I said rarely, but so did I on occasion. We went through all the telltale signs of a cheating wife. She didn't have a secret stash of sexy lingerie, etc., and I answered that I saw no signs of infidelity or I would have immediately filed for divorce, or at the very least hired a private detective to investigate. Despite the defense attorney's success in removing every divorced person from the jury pool, they were both found guilty. Scott was sentenced to 10 years in prison. My wife was sentenced to two years for conspiracy. As they were led out of the court, my wife collapsed. Two bailiffs had to carry my sobbing wife to the holding cell. Her lover tried to break free from his bailiff screaming that he would kill me. He posed a thumb and forefinger as a pretend gun. I responded with just one raised finger. I think you know which finger I raised. I often referred to it as deploying my driving finger. Two days later, the cute U.S. attorney asked me out to lunch. She wanted me to meet Carla, her older sister. She was a fifth grade teacher who was just as cute as her sister and two years younger than I was. We dated for a few weeks, but nothing came of it. I just wasn't ready to date. I was dealing with too much anger and hatred to be good company for anyone. I asked her for a rain check until I emotionally recovered. She agreed. My wife's dreams of taking me for everything I owned in a divorce quickly faded like sunlight on a cold winter's evening. I had some regrets on my scorched earth plan, but they left me no choice. Somebody was headed for prison. I had to make sure it wasn't me. It was only a question of who struck first. If they hadn't bragged about keeping me from my son, I wouldn't have done what I did. There was no way I'd let them destroy my relationship with Arthur. That was the tripwire, the fatal mistake that led to their downfall. Six months later, my divorce was final. My jailbird wife received nothing from our divorce. Once I took our son to visit his mother in prison, but he was so traumatized that I never again took him to see her, though they do write to each other. I phoned Carla and we began seeing each other. I don't know where our relationship is going, but so far... I don't see any red flags or other warning signs. Carla seems to have a weakness for my homemade spaghetti bolognese. 
That's another advantage of being raised and taught to cook by a Sicilian mother. After I made clams casino and lasagna for her, Carla moved in with me. I don't know what happened to Scott in prison. Darlene was now the property of Butch, her 300-pound cellmate, a former professional male wrestler who now claims to be a woman despite still having a tool. That's California for you. He shaved Darlene's head to show that he owned her. She and Butch were in Folsom Federal Prison for women living La Vida Loco. Now for the second story. My name is Terrence. Please don't call me Terry. It points out my shortcomings and makes me sad. Terry is a name for a fun-loving, devil-may-care kind of guy pursued by beautiful, dangerous women. I'm not like that. I'm a serious science major. I'm so ordinary and average that I'm almost invisible, especially to women. I'm so plain and undistinguishable that I would make a great spy. If that wasn't bad enough for me in the romance department, I was a physics major, like my brilliant father and a nonviolent pacifist like my Quaker mother. If I ever wrote my autobiography, I would title it The Invisible Nonviolent Nerd. Despite my lifelong lack of luck with girls, suddenly and inexplicably, I was pursued by two beautiful college coeds in my freshman year of college. Apparently, I possessed some sort of quality that foreign girls found attractive, unlike all the American girls in high school who found me boring. So, you can imagine how shocked I was when my beautiful ex girlfriend, Anastasia, or as I like to call her, the Dragon Lady, shot and killed my beautiful new girlfriend, Lana. I never knew I possessed a quality that would make a beautiful, exotic woman kill for me. Being a physicist means solving mysteries. Women, however, were a mystery I would never solve. On our first day in the autumn semester of my freshman year in college, I met the Anastasia, or as I called her, the Dragon Lady in the cafeteria. She was also in all of my classes, which was an odd coincidence. She looked and acted like the Asian femme fatale character in the comic book and TV show, Terry and the Pirates that I watched on cable. Of all the boys in the cafeteria, most of whom were taller and better looking than I was, she sat down next to me to talk. I'm a complete idiot when it comes to women and what to say to them. It was a struggle, but I didn't drool. I undiplomatically asked why she was talking to me instead of any of the far more handsome boys at the next table. She said smart men were her weakness. I could hardly catch my breath. She wore a traditional Chinese-style turtleneck silk dress, a Chong Sam's, with a silk screen of a fire-breathing dragon on the back. The dragon lady was beautiful, brilliant, mysterious. She seemed a little bit dangerous, and to be perfectly honest, you might call her sinister. She had long black hair and dark eyes that looked right through me. That's why I should have run away, but instead, I fell in love. I could count on one hand all the women who had ever flirted with me. Actually, I could do it on one finger. She had an accent that I couldn't identify, and she wouldn't tell anyone where the accent was from. At least once a week, she would disappear for a few hours. She would never tell me where she went or what she did. She wasn't as affectionate with me as I wished. Sometimes I felt like she was my babysitter, not my girlfriend. She said she liked being mysterious. While the rest of us in college lived in cramped dorms, she had a beautiful penthouse apartment in a high-rise apartment. I stayed in her apartment with her, but she wouldn't sleep with me for the first two weeks we were together. I was so excited I was climbing the walls. For our two-week anniversary, I bought us two sets of rollerblades and all the wrist, guards and knee guards and we rollerblade together on the bike path at the ocean hand in hand. It marked a major change in our relationship. She was so excited by my gift of rollerblades that you might have thought I bought her a Ferrari. She had never had rollerblades or skates as a child and always wanted them. She really warmed up to me and I felt real affection from her. Several times, men in suits took photographs of the two of us while we skated. They didn't look like tourists. They looked so much like feds that all they needed was to have FBI tattooed on their foreheads. I was pretty familiar with what FBI agents looked like because of my father's work. He did some kind of top-secret scientific work for the government and my whole family had to endure a rigorous semi-annual FBI security check. I knew never to discuss his work with anyone. That night after we rollerbladed, we sleep together for the first time. It was the greatest night of my life. The dragon lady instantly knew. There's a first time for everyone. Let me teach you how to pleasure a woman. She whispered. It was the greatest class I ever took. Judging by her reaction, I passed the final. So now we were Terence and the Dragon Lady. 
Anastasia didn't understand the reference until later when I showed her some Terry and the Pirates comic books. She laughed so hard that tears came out of her eyes and then she kissed me. I felt like this was my first time at bat and I had hit a grand slam home run. We got along great and had a lot of respect for one another with one exception. She couldn't believe how much sugar I put in my coffee. She called me her pre-diabetic lover. She had a peculiar habit when we walked arm in arm. She had to have her right hand in her jacket's right pocket. She would only hold my hand with her left hand. I thought it was silly but said nothing. One night, after some Thai food Anastasia had an upset stomach. For at least an hour I held a cold wet wash cloth to her forehead as she vomited into the toilet. I hit the jackpot when I found you, Anastasia said, and then heaved again. Though normally she seemed to be the strong and invulnerable one in our relationship, I was captivated by how defenseless she was now that she was sick. Being able to care for her that evening made me feel stronger and deepened our bond. I was definitely not a macho he-man, but I instinctively understood how to care for a woman I loved. As I said that to myself, I was struck by the realization that I was actually in love for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I understood what being in love felt like. It felt amazing. For six weeks life was good. No, it wasn't just good. It was in fact great I didn't have a lot of money to spend on her, but she didn't care or at least she never said anything. The wardrobe in her closet cost more than my car. I took her to the zoo, the Griffith Observatory, and many more free cultural places and we had a great time on the cheap. I couldn't wait to take her home to meet my parents. One Saturday night we went to see a play in downtown Los Angeles. She looked extra special gorgeous. She wore her hair up, with a long sharp Chinese style hair pinned through it. Because I couldn't afford the parking lot, I found a space for free a few blocks from the theater. After the show we were walking back to the deserted street when three big guys waiting next to my car blocked us. I didn't know what to do but Dragon Lady did. She laughed which infuriated them. One held handcuffs in his hand. The other two aimed guns at us. Dragon Lady's right hand was as always inside her coat pocket. She apparently had a gun in her pocket and shot them through her coat. One was hit in the chest and the other two in their heads. The one shot in the chest lunged at her knocking the gun from her hand. Anastasia turned sidewise and kicked him in his face which stopped him for an instant. Then she took out the long sharp hair pin from her hair and plunged it into her assailant's neck which ended his attack. After she picked up from the ground her snub nose Colt Python 357 Magnum revolver with a sawed-off hammer, she put a round into his head as he choked on his own blood. A nondescript van laid rubber as it raced away. She didn't bat an eye, but took my hand and we quickly entered my parked car. She did mention how pissed she was to have ruined her beautiful coat. To say I was totally freaked out doesn't even begin to express my feelings. Who are you? I asked she just smiled and didn't answer. Are you some kind of spy or assassin? Well, I suppose I could be both, but let's just say I'm a girl who was once mugged and is now always prepared. Then she took out her cell phone, made a call, and whispered what sounded like, clean up two blocks south of the Dorothy Chandler on Grand Avenue on the east side of the street, but I was so upset that I can't be sure that's what she said. I didn't know why she had to kill them. If it was a mugging, we should have just given them our money, though I was puzzled why one of them held handcuffs in his hands. My mother was a Quaker, and that's how I was raised. We're nonviolent pacifists. Loving a killer tore my heart out. I tried to balance my love for Anastasia against the values I was raised with. Now that I saw her kill three men, I could never take my dragon lady, a killer, home to meet my pacifist mother. I stayed awake all night until I came to a decision. In the morning I told her I would never reveal that she shot those men to anyone, but I could no longer stay with her. Violence was against all the beliefs I held dear. She accepted what I said. I saw tears in her eyes as she kissed me on my right cheek, then I took my suitcase and left her apartment. As I left, I heard her whisper, I really loved you. I got into my car and cried for a half hour before I pulled away. How could I love such a cruel cold killer? How could she kill so easily while being so kind and loving with me? I'll never understand women. We saw one another every day in class, but didn't speak to each other. We only nodded. In the cafeteria I sat with friends. She always sat a hundred feet away, alone. I missed her a lot and was tempted to run over and kiss her but I didn't. To tell the truth, as much as I loved her, 
I was also that much afraid of her. A week later, I was rollerblading alone on the bike path lost in my memories of Anastasia, when an incredibly beautiful girl lost balance on her rollerblades, falling and taking me down with her. My pants were torn, but neither of us were hurt so we just laughed. The girl Lana offered to buy me a coffee to make amends, which I immediately accepted. Over our extra-long coffee break, she told me that she had two tickets to a jazz club and wanted to go on date with me that week into the club. I loved jazz and was very excited. She was very touchy-feely with me and I loved it. She told me about her family. Her father was a police officer, as was her mother. I explained that my dad was a scientist and my mom was a fourth-grade teacher at a Quaker school. She was fascinated and wanted to meet them. We had dinner that night with my parents, and we all got along great. She spoke with my father as much as she spoke with me. She had no interest in my mother. For a moment, I thought she was flirting with my dad. She had a scientific background and asked my dad questions about his work and if she and I could visit his lab. Even though he had a few drinks, he wouldn't answer her questions. He repeated the Tom Cruise joke from Top Gun that if he told her, he would have to kill her. We all laughed. He did say that he was proud of me following in his footsteps as a scientist. I wasn't madly in love with Lana like I was with Anastasia, but I liked her a lot. I thought it could grow into love. I guess with the self-confidence I gained from my relationship with Anastasia, I was more desirable to women. That night we met outside the club and went inside together. We ran into two male friends of hers and we all shared a table. It was a great night. I really enjoyed her company and the company of her friends, whose names I couldn't pronounce. They acted like I was the most interesting and exciting guy on earth as they hung on every word I spoke and laughed at all of my jokes. Lana couldn't keep her hands off me. I was on top of the world. The guys kept buying us all drinks and I did in fact drink too much, much more than the rest of our party. With their help, I staggered out of the club. They said I was too drunk to drive and I agreed. They guided me towards their panel van and I stopped to catch my breath. Lana slid open the side door to the panel van and the other guys were guiding and pushing me inside when three shots rang out. From my previous experience with Dragon Lady, I recognized the explosive sound that a 357 Magnum makes. The Dragon Lady and two guys with her jumped out of another panel van and ran towards me firing as they ran. Lana and one of the guys were now missing their heads. The third one lay on the ground, pulling out a gun. He aimed it at Anastasia. I still loved her. I couldn't let him hurt her. I didn't think. I acted instinctively and pushed the gun aimed at my dragon lady into his chest while I pushed his finger to pull the trigger, killing him instantly. I was a Quaker and ashamed of myself. I began vomiting into the gutter. Anastasia administered a coup de grace to the heads of Lana and her two friends, then ransacked their pockets taking their wallets and cell phones. She asked if I was all right and tried to kiss me. I pushed her away. Then they shoved me into their van. One of Dragon Lady's guys drove off in the other van with the three dead bodies. As drunk as I had been, I quickly sobered up. I just killed a man. How could I have done that? I was a Quaker. What the hell just happened? Dragon Lady handed me a thermos of coffee and ordered me to drink. I wasn't about to argue with a stone-cold murderer so I drank. My alcohol-soaked judgment was a little off and I asked if they had any sugar for the coffee. Anastasia started laughing. They drove into a warehouse and we went up to an apartment in a freight elevator. By now I was sober enough to be scared and kept my mouth shut. They spread dozens of photos on the dining room table of Lana and her two friends plus five more people who seemed to have been stalking me for the past two weeks. Who are you and who are they? I think I was sober but was still so confused that I didn't understand anything. Dragon Lady spoke as she handed me a cup of coffee and some sugar. We're from the Ukrainian Intelligence Agency. Ukrainian, but you're Asian. I said, I'm half Asian. She said, your late girlfriend isn't named Lana. Her name is Svetlana Porkova. She and her friends were a kidnap and hit team who worked for the FSB, the Russian Ministry of Intelligence. Anastasia said, Artem took the floor. Russia has assembled thousands of bomb-carrying drones to destroy the Ukraine. Your father has succeeded in developing electronic countermeasures to make the Russian drones crash. The Russians planned on kidnapping you and threatening to kill you unless your father revealed how his countermeasures could be overcome. Then Anastasia spoke. I was assigned to shadow and protect you. 
That's why we were ambushed outside the play we saw that night. Unfortunately, they didn't give up. It actually worked out well that you broke up with me. It enabled us to flush them all out. I think I looked like a love-sick puppy when I said to Anastasia, You used me as bait. So, I was just a job for you? She took my hand. Yes, at the beginning, but it turned into something more, a lot more for me. Artem put his hand on my shoulder. You're all she's talked about for the past month. You must be awfully special. I think I blushed. I was heavily conflicted. I was raised to be a non-violent pacifist, even if it meant my death. Anastasia had saved my life. Twice. But she had killed us six people to do it. On one hand, my upbringing told me that this was evil, and she was wrong. On the other hand, because of her actions, I was still alive. I liked being alive. My mother's religion was a noble abstraction. But I now understood the concept of kill or be killed. I decided that it is morally okay to kill a murderer. If in the long run it saves lives, especially if one of the lives is mine or the woman I loved. I ran through all of the many hours of philosophical discussions I had in Quaker schools about nonviolence. Now however I understood that this decision was easy. It all came down to this, life or death, them or us. It now seemed so simple and clear. A man tried to kill the woman I loved, but I killed him first. I felt guilty that I didn't feel guilty. I tried to rationalize that I acted in defense of another, but the Quaker religion does not acknowledge that exception. I guess I was no longer a Quaker. I wanted to stay alive, so I did what I had to do. Though I acted instinctively now, an hour later with plenty of time to reconsider my action, I wouldn't change a thing. Anastasia took my hand. I know about your religious beliefs. How are you feeling right now after you killed a man? I think I understand the Quaker religion much better right now. Most of the time it's a wonderful philosophy, but it's not a suicide pact. Perhaps most other Quakers didn't feel that way, but we must each make our own decisions. That's the essence of free will. What about the other guys in these photos? I asked. Anastasia looked at her watch. Earlier this evening, they were also eliminated. Will they keep coming after me? I asked as I nervously tapped my toes. Artem spoke with a serious voice. We believe so, but now they'll really want your scalp. Because of you, they've lost more than ten of their best agents. Oh great, now what do I do? I covered my face with my hands. Dragon Lady put her hand on my back and rubbed it. You can stay here until they kill you, or you can live with me and accept a full scholarship at the Institute for Science in Kiev. By the time you graduate the technology will have advanced enough that your father's work will be obsolete and you will be safe. All worries about exile and murder were erased from my mind. Live with you? Do you mean that? The dragon lady pulled my head towards her. Yes, you're something of an acquired taste, but you've grown on me. I didn't lie to you when we first spoke. I'm only turned on by really smart men, and you're as smart as they come. Okay, I'll go to Ukraine. I whispered. I didn't think I had a choice. One of the guys made a phone call, and the next thing I knew we were driving to the Long Beach Harbor. The dragon lady said we wouldn't be safe at the airport. The Russians would be watching for us there. We boarded a ship bound for who knows where with our ultimate destination in the Ukraine. The next morning, we were out at sea. I walked the deck with Anastasia and the other guys. I put my arms around Anastasia and told her I loved her. Then she kissed me back. I love you too. Terence. I put my arms around Anastasia. I no longer feel like a Terence, Dragon Lady. From now on you can call me Terry. She pointed to her three associates, each of whom wore a shoulder holster, as did I. Of course, Terry. And these are your pirates. Dear listeners, sending loads of love to Ronald Burns for his contribution, and to all our listeners, thank you for being part of this literary journey with us. You can check out Ron's work at Amazon. And we have shared the links in the description box below. And if you want to share your work with us, please send your work at the email mentioned in the description box, and we will publish it for our listeners at Lost Love Chronicles. Please share your thoughts in the comment section, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.